Hello, my name is Ian Scales. You're watching Telecom TV, and I'm, we're at the Smart IoT London event, where I'm going to be talking to Hayden Povey. Hayden is the CEO of Secure Things, and we're going to be talking about security. Hayden, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. That's all right. Um, what's the challenge in terms of security with IoT? What makes IoT security a problem? I think there are a wide range of issues uh, around the security with IoT, which go into the long-term ownership and management of our systems. The biggest challenge today is that we're used to security on our mobile phone, and our mobile phones will normally last perhaps two years when we replace them. However, with IoT, this is going to be wedded into our infrastructure, our industries, our hospitals, our building automation systems for 10, 20, 50 years. When we think about IoT in our water treatment plant, it may be there for 30 plus years. And yet the security that we're putting into those systems, we're imbuing into those systems, doesn't uh, deal with those sort of length of time. We, we treat IoT as something which is practically correct. We put it out there and we assume it's going to work perfectly forever. The real challenge is though that any system that we build is by its very nature imperfect. We're humans. So the likelihood of somebody attacking that system and gaining control of that system is incredibly high. And for any uh, critical infrastructure system or any industry system, the results uh, of that can be catastrophic. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's the sort of background to this. Mm -hmm. How do we ameliorate that problem? How can we look at security in a different way that kind of suits the challenges we're facing okay. with IoT? The, one of the challenges that we have with security as it exists today with IoT is that we really have um, uh, perimeter security within our systems. We think about firewalls. If we look at the guidance as it exists from Department of Homeland Security, uh, Center of Protection of National Infrastructure, the friendly face of MI5, um, we, we look at how we use firewalls to try and separate the, the components of uh, industry. And of course with IoT that doesn't work anymore. Any uh, peripheral security is going to get breached at some point. That's just the reality. We have to be right 100% of the time. The attacker only has to be right once to own the system. So instead we have to look at how we manage the system with the assumption that we are going to get owned. The hacker is always going to win. That is the reality in any complex system. So we have to then look at how we recover, how we remediate, update, fix the system, and then how we reset it. So we have to kind of move from this um, igloo type of security, a crunchy outside shell uh, and chewy inside, um, to uh, a system where we assume that we're always going to lose. So get used to that. How are you going to recover? How are you going to manage in, in those scenarios? Okay. Go into a little bit more detail about this because I know there's other aspects to this as well, oh. um, which are about at the same time as, if you like, you know, when you're talking about ameliorating the harm once the hacker's in and mm -hmm. you know re recovering the system, there are other benefits. If you institute a system which enables you to do that, there are other benefits that accrue, not just keeping keeping the, the bad guys out mm -hmm. of your system, but also in terms of extending the working life of the of the thing and assuring. Know, TCO and so on. Talk well, a little bit about that because it's more than security, isn't it? It, it, it is. Uh, and I think that this also comes back to understanding the impact uh, of an attack. So first of all, when we think about IoT today, again, people think about the outlay cost of putting out systems. But they don't really think about what happens when it goes wrong and how they have to manage that over its life cycle. So uh, again, a water treatment plant may have this very long life cycle or national infrastructure of, of 20, 30 years. The way that we're going today, you, every couple of years, you're going to have to go out and you're going to have to put new sensors out or you're going to have to put new infrastructure in place, which is kind of crazy. Every time a truck has to roll to go and update a system or replace a system, it costs real money to the organization. So if we can manage those systems better, then we're going to bring down the total cost of ownership for those, those systems quite substantially. Another aspect of that is actually uh, cyber insurance. 
So when we think about how Allianz or AXA or Howden or somebody else try and ensure or put a premium around your business, how are they going to judge the risk? Now, if the risk is, is infinite because anybody can break into your system, you're either not going to get insurance or the premiums are going to be very high. Uh, whether you're building automation or industrial or anything like that. So by being able to put a framework around that where we can uh, specify what level of security that we have in there and we can show, okay, well, maybe it can be broken today, but we can very rapidly fix that, remediate it. Then we can prove formally um, to the insurance companies that we have a plan, which is fabulous. Because the alternatives are catastrophic, as we've seen recently. Um, so a couple of months ago, uh, we saw a steel mill in Germany be attacked. They attacked a very simple um, furnace controller. And they managed to create $50 million worth of damage, mm. which is a, just a tremendous uh, amount. Um, you know, the steel which came out was of known, unknown quality, so that had to be scrapped, the issues with the crucible and things along those lines. Similarly, what is the cost of an impact on a water treatment plant again? If somebody can go along and they can change the amount of fluorine which is added or cast um, some other chemicals into the system, then you can have a, a widespread poisoning outbreak. Now, unfortunately, that's not James Bond anymore. That actually happened last week, uh, where people did get in and they were able to uh, adjust the amount of chemicals which were dispersed into the system. Further back, we know Admiral Rogers, head of the NSA, uh, he uh, ordered a review of the US power grid. It was found to be absolutely full of APTs, these advanced persistent threats. The uh, value put against that was, well, it's $100 billion to replace the grid. That's a huge amount well, of money. Yeah. But it's a trillion dollars if something goes wrong. Yeah. And these are just mind-boggling numbers, but we have to think about how we, <laughs> how we do this. So the total cost of ownership is, of course, the fact that we don't have to replace these systems, and we can manage these over the long term, but actually also the cost on the downside, you know, if something goes wrong, yes. can be truly catastrophic, not to mention brand uh, yes. damage as well. brand killing. So you've got to factor in the catastrophic as well, mm -hmm. in terms of its risk value or, uh, or minus value, to work out what the total cost of ownership it's going to be you can't you know as if it was being insured if you so that's your cost exactly and and i think the interesting thing is we are just now getting a better feel for the cost of an infosec a traditional uh, information technology breach and we're starting to see the brand damage it can have yeah. for people like target and talk talk uh, and the impact it has on consumers yes the problem is when we talk about operational technology and the impact that it can have on there, it really is an order of magnitude higher. The nice thing about uh, IT and you know somebody steals your bank details, well, the banks have a huge set of back, uh, back end system computers which can manage that risk. They can see that you're not really in Rio de Janeiro, you know, uh, yeah. buying a new TV. Ho hopefully, yeah. <laughs> um, with OT systems, we don't see this, and I, I think this is my new definition of Internet of Things, IoT, is actually information operational technology, bringing together the requirements of InfoSec and information technology and operational te technology. That really is, uh, I think, a better definition of what real world IoT is all right. about. Right, which factors in all the, all the extra costs that you don't know about. Um, well, I suppose another way of looking at this is that you, the industry can become kind of blind to um, operational costs when the the capital costs seem to be so low. Mm -hmm. So you've mm -hmm. got you know this classic um, catch up where you've you've invested in because of the the capital cost of dispersing a whole lot of the sensors <laughs> is next to nothing and you you're full of joy. But actually the operational costs of looking after it for ten years dwarf that. Uh, uh, absolutely. Or can dwarf that. Uh, and the way in which companies do their risk mitigation strategies today, you know, if there's a fire in this factory or if, you know, an earthquake in that city, people are having to think about how this impacts their business. But very few people are saying, okay, well, what happens if my infrastructure, my sensors, my actuators are, are, are impacted? So what do you offer then, um, Hayden, in terms of, of a product or a service to people? 
to, to, to implement? Well, obviously, it's a, it's a complex domain. Uh, IoT is huge. Security is huge. Uh, where we are focusing is in two areas, and I really see them as two sides of a coin. First of all, we're working with silicon partners, um, the microcontroller vendors underpinning this industry, to add additional security into uh, their devices, um, helping them ensure that they have the right hooks in those systems, and then creating a layer of software, firmware, which can utilize that cryptographic framework to create the right um, solution for very secure, cryptographically robust, uh, over-the-air updates. And traditionally, OTA um, is done at the operating system level. The reality is that can be owned. So we have to go all the way down to the bootloader and into the the booting process of the chip. And we're working with uh, silicon partners to offer um, that firmware and that framework. How much scope do you get in terms of real estate on the chip to be able to do what are, sound to me like quite complex tasks mm -hmm. on board? And what is, after all, a micro microcontroller? I assume that they're growing Moore's law-wise, you know, doubling the amount of intelligence on them every couple of years. Is that the case, and are you able to actually implement quite com complex software um, on board them? Yes, well, the, the, the software that we need is not massive. It's uh, of a few K uh, in size. Of course, what you need there are the right cryptographic accelerators, um, so both symmetric and asymmetric. You need the right root of trust to be imbued in the design. So that doesn't cost an awful lot of silicon. It does have some impact. But people are already doing this because we need to have the right uh, parts of the... Um, have you got a proprietary industry. technique for that? Because I, I assume you really then have to start talking and working with people really at the early stages of chip design. Uh, we certainly do. We, well, we've worked with, with companies uh, who are partway through their design cycle and, and companies coming to it new, and in fact we're partnering with Arm on some of their future uh, technologies as well. Um, fundamentals of cryptography are very well known and defined, and you don't mess with those because um, they are very well trusted and, and, and mathematically so. So we can use, for example, um, asymmetric cryptography such as RSA and elliptic curve cryptography and we can use symmetric cryptography uh, AES 128, 256, um, uh, the, the SHA technology. These things are, are fundamentally well-known policies often used in the mobile world, uh, mobile phone world but we can imbue these down in the microcontroller today, and I think that that's, that's what's changing. So what's your secret source? Is the, it the ability to, to actually implement well-known cryptographic software tools already, but to embed them more, most efficiently? The, that, that's right. So in the, in the microcontroller, it's our ability to create the right uh, cryptographic chain of trust, this root of trust, and then offer a set of services uh, underneath uh, the RTOS is part of the boot chain, which then allows us to uh, apply updates uh, remotely uh, f in a very trusted way where we can avoid rollback attacks going to previous versions of software. We can ensure that the uh, signature on the update has been done correctly. We can make sure um, that modules can be loaded. So as we move from a monolithic application uh, direction to more modular microcontroller code, we can allow even modules inside that framework to be updated. Um, so we have a, a far stronger and more, but more flexible solution to how updates can be done to the edge. So do you think the microcontroller market as it stands now, and, in, and with ARM in particular, um, has caught up so that you're now able to you know, enable this level of security because where the, of where the micro, microcontroller has got to? Um, yeah, I think there are a couple of things. I think um, the process technology, so in terms of being able to fit more transistors on the, uh, on the die, some of the flash technology, but fundamentally some of the techniques, the isolation uh, which is required, the ability to create high integrity devices, 
uh, and the ability to create high availability devices. These are the other aspects of security which are often forgotten. So I think that allows us to create a, a more robust edge node which we can then start to apply. The other side of the things that we're doing, of course, is then in the enterprise, which is how do you apply those updates? Um, one of the problems with FOTA, firmware over the air updates, is you just assume that you can throw it over the wall and it lands and everything's fine. Yeah, yeah. The problem is that in a modern enterprise, that just can't happen. If you're updating a module, a drive, a control, in a process control system, you don't want the OEM to say, here, in a press send, I'm going to send out a new update to everybody in the world. Mm. That doesn't work because you're doing something critical. You don't want to mm. update a train while it's driving. Mm -hmm. You don't want to upgrade a steel mill when it's yes. smelting. You don't want to yes. um, do a lot of these things. It's In many ways, it's when not to apply it as yes. opposed to when to apply it. Yes. Um, so we have uh, the ability and appliance uh, in the enterprise which allows us to connect to the devices to uh, apply the right um, rules, the right policy, the right orchestration for how those updates are, are applied um, <coughs> while ensuring they are uh, properly signed and properly managed. Okay. Um, the next problem of course is that that then becomes uh, the Achilles heel of the system, that is where every attacker is going to focus because now you're bringing in the updates from the OEMs and you're yeah. siphoning them out to the systems. Um, so that appliance itself has to be both physically and um, from a software perspective very robust and reliant. So you know, because 9 out of 10 attacks still involve an inside guy, yeah. Um, it has to be physically tamper resistant, um, but because you're going to have a lot of software attacks, it has to be very uh, robust from that direction. Um, and it's also going to be subject to denial of service attacks, so it has to maintain high availability. The other problem is any update flying around the system, of necessity, is an encrypted blob. Therefore, it looks an awful lot like a virus. Right. So the way in which you have to manage that through the enterprise, integrating into the InfoSec system, integrating into the information technology system, has to be managed uh, very well. So we have to reach out. We have to look at authentication and authorization databases. We have to ensure that we have the right VPNs and the InfoSec system can trust us uh, and then push those out. To, to the edge devices. So it's a very complex cryptographic problem, but only by having both sides of the puzzle, the enterprise appliance which can manage these updates, can ensure they, they operate correctly and, and put them out there, can, can, can that work? Good. Well, that's um, great. Well, thank you very much for your time, and that was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you.